But let's kick things off. Hello, welcome everyone to Inside the Application Literally. My name is Laurel Grodman and I'm Assistant Dean for Admissions at the Yale School of Management. I'm also a member of the Yale S1 class of 2006. Thanks so much for joining us today. So as the title of the event implies, I'm going to open up our application, share my screen and provide a walkthrough of the application live. This is a little bit different than some of our other events, like our best application advice or application workshops, which are coming up over the next couple of months, um, in that we're going to dive into some of the more ticky tacky specific parts of the application that sometimes get overlooked, but are actually really important. I'm also going to go through a couple of parts of the process that happen after you hit submit. So namely our video questions, our behavioral assessment, and our interview. Today's format does not allow for Q&A, so we aren't going to have time at the end of today's session to answer questions. I'm going to cover a lot of content in the 45 or so minutes that we have together. But those other events that I mentioned are best app advice and absolutely the application workshops give lots of opportunity for interaction with our admissions team. So I encourage you to sign up for those as well. So before before I open up the application itself, I just want to share a few words about the philosophy behind our approach to the application and more generally how we evaluate candidates at Yale SOM, which I hope will frame our walkthrough of the application in some useful ways. So I like to think about this through kind of the metaphor of a dialogue. So although sitting down to complete a business school application can really feel like a one-way monologue when you're telling us about yourselves, I really do encourage you to think about it as a dialogue. The application itself is our part of the dialogue. It's the admissions committee sharing with you what's important to us and what we want to learn about you. At SOM, we're very thoughtful about our role in this conversation. We spend a lot of time as a committee identifying what matters to us in assessing candidates and in turn, the information that we need from you in order to gather what we need from the application to make those assessments. And we put a lot of thought about how our application is constructed to get at that information. So the questions and the prompts you see in our application are our part of the dialogue. They're what we're hoping to learn about you. And we try to be good communicators. So one of our guiding principles is to ask only questions that we feel are relevant to evaluating your candidacy. And hopefully your experience is that our application feels more intentional and streamlined as a result. So with that, I'll note that the admissions committee sees the vast majority of what you submit during our reading and review process, but not necessarily everything and not necessarily all at once. Anything that we're collecting purely for statistical or reporting purposes, we won't see as part of the application read. And I'll point out a couple of other instances of information we may not see until later in the process. But by and large, we're asking you for things that will directly feed into our assessment of your candidacy. As for your role, as with any good conversation, it's important to be both a good listener and a good communicator. So I hope today I'll be able to help you with the listening part by giving you a sense, not just of what we're asking, but why we're asking it and the kinds of information that we're hoping to get uh, from you from the individual questions. And in turn, I hope that will position you for your part of the conversation, which is sharing the relevant information about yourself and helping us connect the dots. So at a high level, what we're looking for are really, it boils down to three things. It's your academic potential to, uh, to excel in an academically rigorous program. It's evidence of your professional impact, so your ability to lead and contribute in the organizations that you're a part of, and how you'll contribute to the communities that you're a part of, how you operate and interact in those communities and organizations. So everything that we, ask you, that we ask you contributes to our understanding of one or more of those things about you. And I'll try to point that out as we go through the individual elements within the application. We also believe strongly um, that bringing in a diverse group of students across backgrounds, geographies, interests, and experiences is essential to creating a community that lives our mission, which is educating leaders for business and society. And we believe that students from an incredibly wide range of backgrounds and circumstances can thrive at SOM. And so to this end, we've built elements into our application to look at the environmental factors that you've experienced as one aspect of your candidacy. We care about how you got to where you are and understanding your individual story that led you to this point in the trajectory. So with that, I'm just going to take a moment to open up the application so I can share that with you. And... 
we will dive in. Okay, so to kick things off, we will begin with the instructions, everyone's favorite part of an application. Um, in actuality, I want to spend a couple of minutes on this because we have been very thoughtful about putting together our application and giving you all the information you need within the application itself to make sure that you have the necessary guidance to answer what's within. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is you'll find it in an abbreviated form um, within each page of the application, why we're asking the questions we're asking, what we're hoping to get out of uh, this section to serve as an additional guide there. We also have uh, what we call our online application guide, which I think we'll share a link to in the chat. Um, this is another helpful resource to have as a companion as you fill out your application. And I actually recommend just taking a look through it even before you get started, just as a refresher um, on some of, the, uh, some of the things that we're talking about today and a couple of additional insights. I do wanna call out that if you apply to uh, Yale SOM either through the consortium or through QuestBridge, which are two other application channels that we support, all of the same things that I'm talking about today will apply. You'll just see them through a combination of the kind of direct application through either the consortium and QuestBridge, as well as the Yale specific supplement. So no matter how you supply the information, we're seeing it in the same, end, in the same way on our end and we're reviewing it the exact same way. One of the things um, I will call out here are our application dates. So we have all three rounds ahead of us. Uh, the first one, round one, our first deadline kicking off on September 10th. One important thing I'll point out to be mindful of is what we call our post-submission materials deadline. So a couple of things we'll talk, be talking about at the end of today's session, like the video questions and the behavioral assessment will be due at the post-submission materials deadline. So a couple of days after the normal application deadline to get those materials in, but you wanna be mindful uh, and make sure that that happens because we can't begin review until we have it. I will uh, point out just a couple of other things. So we have a sliding scale application fee, which means that the application you the fee you pay will be based on your current level of income. You can see more details around that, but depending on, again, your, your level of income right now, your application fee will, uh, will be at one of three different tiers. So you want to make sure you enter that information correctly. Uh, actually heading upwards again, I want to mention uh, application fee waivers. So you'll see there's a number of categories for which we provide application fee waivers. You want to make sure to address that a couple of days before the application deadline. There's a, deadline. There's a form you'll have to fill out um, so that you won't have any issues on deadline day. One a new fee waiver category I'd specifically like to call out this year is um, a fee waiver that's available to students and alumni of almost 700 universities that have significant initiatives to promote economic diversity. So these are schools where at least 35% of students receive U.S. Pell Grants, and the list includes many historically Black colleges and universities, as well as regional public universities and rural serving institutions. Um, we know that school choice can be largely driven by circumstances and opportunities that are available to someone, and we want to continue to make sure that we are expanding opportunities, expanding access to individuals for whom financial considerations might loom especially large in their decision-making process. So I'm really pleased that we're able to offer this new uh, category of fee waiver this year. The last thing I'll touch upon on the instruction page, also new for this year, is our statement on AI. So we, not surprisingly, get lots of questions and concerns from candidates about if and how to use AI appropriate, appropriately within the uh, application process. And I encourage you to read the statement in full. Um, but in a nutshell, I would say I would encourage you to use AI in the same way that you would use a trusted friend. So as a resource to bounce ideas off of, to brainstorm, to help refine thinking, maybe on the other end of the process to help put finishing touches, spell check, grammar check, that sort of thing on, on essays. But really the intent of the application process is for us to hear you and your voice and your authentic story that you bring to us. 
So AI, if used at all, ought to be, you know, a, a supplement or enabler to that the way that a human friend would be, um, but definitely not a replacement for that. And we can talk about this a little bit more when we get to these sections, but um, when it comes to using AI for the spoken aspects of our application, namely the, uh, the interview and the video questions, my advice here is simply don't. Um, we tried to practice what we preach. We actually created this statement with the help of AI um, and ended up having to very heavily modify it and supplement it uh, by the, the humans on our admissions team because we found that it was good for helping us refine our thinking and um, you know, uh, help us kind of consolidate the things that we were hoping to get across, but in order to really have the message say what we wanted it to, uh, it did require mostly input from our team. And I imagine uh, an experience of writing an essay would be largely the same if you choose to engage with, a with AI. So with that, we'll move off of the uh, instructions page, but lots of content within there that's worth stopping on. So the next thing you'll do is sign our statement of honesty, which we're not going to look at just now. Where I'm going to move now is the personal information. So this is a fairly straightforward page. Most of this is biographical, demographical um, information um, that we'll collect from you. But there are a couple of things in here where we'll start to get some context for your application about who you are. So we'll ask, um, scroll down here, if you were a member of the military, if you've applied to Yale SOM within the previous five years, if it's been within the last two years, we'll see a little bit later, there's a little bit of uh, additional information we'll ask from you in the essay section. I'll point out here, uh, applying for a joint degree. So we have at Yale SOM, as you can see, quite a few um, joint degree options with our peer programs within the university. Um, what I'll say here is uh, to keep in mind is these are entirely separate application processes. Um, each school has its own application, its own process. We merely notify one another, um, you know, through the information that we're gaining here of your intent to apply to a joint degree. And then ultimately, if you did apply and, and were admitted, but the review process is entirely separate. And so you may receive different decisions or the same decision from two different schools, but just be mindful of there is no uniform joint application process. You will have to go through that process for each individual school. So something to be mindful of timelines. And I think we'll share in the chat um, a little bit more information on our joint degrees. Okay, so let's start to get into the real meat of things. And so I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that the three sort of big things that we're looking at, your academic potential, your professional impact, and your community uh, membership. Uh, academics is the first one up that we'll look at just because that's the order that it comes in here. Um, and the two areas that we'll really kind of use to give us information about that are your academic record and your test scores, along with actually the behavioral assessment, which we'll get to later um, in, the, in the conversation. But as far as the written application here, we'll start with academic record. And what, what I'll say is these areas are really meant to work in tandem. Um, when we're thinking about your academic and your test scores, we're not thinking of these as two separate entities. We're trying to understand your potential from a number of different angles. And so if you are less well prepared in one area, let's say your quantitative preparation um, in your undergraduate experience, we'll maybe rely a little bit more heavily on the information that we get from your test scores in that area or vice versa. So I would think of these as two dynamic sections that are working together to give us the information that we're looking for. Okay, so here you'll see just the general setup of these sections. You'll see uh, why we're asking, some suggestions on you know, how to approach it, what to list, submitting transcripts. Um, here we give a little bit more specific information. So uh, this is the general setup you'll see within each section. So for the academic record, I really encourage you to look at these instructions really closely. Academic kind of information issues are the number one thing that holds up an application review and means that we are not able to proceed. Um, in particular, not having sufficient, uh, not having all of your transcripts or in the, in the transcripts that have the information that's needed. So look really closely at that information, particularly if you've attended multiple schools or study abroad, 
um, you'll want to make sure that you're adequately covering everything there. So you'll see when you go in to add your academic, uh, your academic information, we'll ask for a number of different things in here. We will ask for a copy of your transcript. One thing that I want to call out is it is really helpful to have in your institution's own words and own systems how do Obviously, we read thousands of transcripts every year and have built up expertise in that, but every school sometimes has different information and nuance to share. So first and best option is make sure that that information is provided on the copy of the transcript that you've given us. Oftentimes it's on the back um, and then you'll be covered. If it is not there, we ask you to give us a link over here to the resources that are available online to translate the transcript. Nearly every school will have this available. So I, uh, I ask you to please help us out in our reading process and uh, provide that information. Also make sure you follow the instructions around things like entering your GPA really carefully. Um, lots of times GPA is not reported on a transcript. We're not asking you to kind of formulate your own. You'll just check that no GPA reported on the transcript. Um, and you'll go through that this process for each of the academic institutions that you've uh, that you've attended. I'll point out here uh, your quantitative background. We'll ask you some information on a couple of the quantitative courses uh, that you've taken. Most important thing I want to call out here is this is absolutely not a requirement for admission to have had experience in any or all of the areas that we ask about accounting, calculus, finance, microeconomics, and statistics. This is giving us a sense of what your starting point is. It's also one of the main pieces of information we use to identify candidates for what we call math camp, which is our summer prep uh, experience that happens just before the start of orientation for people who may be a little bit less exposed to quantitative concepts or for whom it's been a really long time since they've engaged in that kind of work. So this is one of the areas that we pull that information from, but it, it should not be a deterrent to applying um, if this is not an area that you've had deep experience in. All right, the next thing I'll call out here is we have a program called Silver Scholars, which is intended for people who are in, for the most part, who are in their final year of an undergraduate experience or maybe in a year of the immediate post undergraduate master's experience, but primarily college seniors. Um, that is structured such that you join SOM immediately after graduation, you spend one or more years gaining professional experience, and then you return to SOM for the final year of your MBA experience. If you are a college senior, you'll absolutely want to make sure that you check off yes over here. Uh, before you move on to the rest of the application, because there are other parts of the application, mostly the work experience section that will look quite different depending on whether this box is checked or not. So if you are in fact a college senior or otherwise qualify for this, this statement, you'll wanna make sure that you check yes on that before you move over. One last thing I'll spend a moment on on this page, because I think there's probably no other event or, or webinar that talks about this, but I think for those for whom it's relevant, it's, it's very important, is this what we call our disciplinary review section. So this asks if you've ever been disciplined or placed under academic set, uh, sanction in an academic setting, you've ever been convicted of um, felony or misdemeanor or other sort of it's, um, issues within the legal system, and also if you've had any uh, GMAT or GRE test score cancellations or violations. So this is a good example of what I mentioned earlier, how when we review your application, we don't necessarily see everything all at once. We know that for those for individuals who are checking yes to any of these things, there's probably a lot of information that we need around it to truly understand the context of, of your situation and, and where this falls within your trajectory. And we know that this information without, um, without a lot of context can be potentially biasing or overwhelming within the context of an application read. So we actually proceed with our application review without this information and a separate subcommittee will see this information and then determine if we need to do any kind of follow-up um, information collection or anything like that. But 
Um, this is absolutely not a deal breaker. Um, there are lots of instances that require, as I said, more explanation to fully kind of understand. And so we want to give you an opportunity to do that. And this is where we give a chance uh, to do that without having it necessarily color or influence the rest of your application review. All right, so moving on to test scores. Section is fairly straightforward. I'll just say uh, briefly, we require all test scores that you submit to be verified. So you'll self-report your scores here on the application, but you need to make sure that you have all official scores sent to us by the post uh, submission materials deadline, which is, as I mentioned before, just a couple of days after the application deadline. So even better to get it done when you take the test or before the deadline, but at the very latest, you'll wanna make sure you have official scores sent by the post material application deadline. We ask you to include every score, all the scores. We look at progression. We look to understand how uh, how your test taking has has um, has has moved over time if you've taken the test more than once. It's also possible you may have scored higher on a particular subsection in one setting, and that's all useful information for us to have. We're always going to consider your highest uh, setting in in the context of our application review. But again, that progression and that that history is really important as well, and it shows some some grit and some gumption to have worked on the test and taken it multiple times. And so um, that's that's helpful for us to have. We get the question a lot, can I submit test scores after the deadline? Um, I'll, I'll say yes, but there's no guarantee that we will be able to include that in your review. We really do try our very best to accept your additional information after um, after the application deadline as new information comes up, including test uh, testing. So we'll do our best, but we can only guarantee that uh, that test scores submitted by the application deadline can be, can fall under the normal course of review. Okay, so that is that sort of brings us to the end of the academic sector, primarily where we get our academic information from. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to that uh, that area that I described before is your professional impact. And so that, that information is really gained, I think, through a combination of your work, ex the work experience section here, we'll go to the post MBA interests, your letters of recommendation, um, I think are probably the primary areas that we gain that information from. So starting with work experience, once again, just as a reminder, if you are applying to the Silver Scholars Program, you'll wanna make sure that you check that box earlier so that this information will look slightly different. Um, for that, but this is the view that you would uh, see as a non-silver scholar. So a couple of things that I'll point out here, we will ask you both to submit a copy of your resume, as well as to enter each of your individual employment experience, which you may be asking why that's redundant, it's all the same things. But actually, I would say one of the most overlooked part of the application, one that I would definitely encourage you to take a look at, not the night before the application is due, because it may catch you by surprise how much information is being asked for, but are these individual work experiences. So actually I'm gonna open up a different one here. So within each of your work experiences, we're gonna ask you for just some basic information about the organization that you worked for, your compensation, your industry job function. But the real to me more interesting part of this is we do ask a couple of questions at the end. Um, we ask you for, a description in your own words of, of your, your company uh, or organization. This is especially useful, I think, if you're working for a more local or regional company that the committee may not be as familiar with or a startup, um, just to give kind of a brief overview of, uh, of the organization. And then similarly, a brief description of your role. So in 25 words or less, how would you describe kind of the core of what it is that you do? And if you've had multiple roles within an organization, I'd say I'd say focus on your most recent role. And then this one over here, reason for leaving. This is the part to me that is most additive to the resume because we don't get that information from the resume. All we get is blocks of time. So we know that you went from company A to company B, but we don't know why. So this is your chance to give us a little bit more information about your thought process and help connect the dots in your career trajectory in a really useful way. 
Um, I will say these examples that I've given in my own experience here are not great ones. I think they're pretty, they're pretty brief. They're a little bit of a missed opportunity. I'd say the least helpful thing that you can say as reason for leaving is got a new job or decided to leave. That's not giving us that much more than what is on your, uh, your resume. So what I would suggest is using this opportunity to uh, to provide us with a little bit more, again, of the glue between the different aspects of your of your resume to help us really kind of build a story there and understand your full career trajectory. The last thing I'll note here is uh, we have two additional boxes down here. So if this is a company that you founded or co-founded, you'll check this one and you'll see a number of different questions. So these are questions that we actually developed in concert with the Dean of our Entrepreneurship Program, Kyle Jensen, that are very similar to questions he asks about uh, startups as part of uh, one of the fellowship awarding processes within uh, SOM. And so we found that sometimes the resume doesn't provide ample opportunity for, uh, for founders and entrepreneurs to really showcase what it is that they have uh, achieved within their startup experience because in part, because you may be at many, many different stages within, uh, within the process of an entrepreneurial venture. So this gives some prompts to allow us to better understand what you've been working on an opportunity to provide us with some public information about your um, about your your startup so that we can understand it in a more holistic manner. So make sure to take advantage of that if you uh, have founded or co-founded a company. And then otherwise, if the company is a startup, but you're not the founder, you'll just mark that here again. So we'll have a little bit of context for your organization where you're gaining experience. So that's the employment entry. So again, a little bit more information than you might be anticipating. So I encourage you to take a look through that earlier in filling out your application. And then your resume, um, we, we offer lots of opportunities to talk about um, you know, best practices for resume development. So I'm not going to spend our time today doing that, but I'm just gonna note that we do have, um, if you were looking for a starting point, we offer a, the official Yale SOM resume template that you would use as a student in the program. We don't have any preference for you using this, but if you're looking for a place to start, I think that's a good one. All right. Um, just another thing that we'll uh, ask for here, and I think of this again as sort of the glue between the building blocks of your application is gaps in work experience. So rather than have the admissions committee wonder why there was a, you know, a, a six month gap after you graduated from college or a year in between two particular work experiences, we simply ask for you to tell us. It's not a inherently bad thing to have pauses in work experience. We understand for many, many reasons that might be the case. But rather than leaving it up to chance for us to interpret that, we ask you just to share that information. So make sure if you have any gaps of employment of more than three months since graduating, um, that is not uh, part of an academic experience, that you use this point to, uh, to give us that information. Down here, choice of recommenders. Um, we ask you, uh, so Again, lots of resources out there on selecting your recommenders. Um, so I'm not gonna spend time on that today, but what I will point out is it is ideal for you to have as one of your letters of recommendation, a current supervisor. So someone who's in a supervisory role to you and is currently that person, and again, is the ideal. But we know for a variety of reasons, people may not have uh, access to that or may choose not to use that. And so if the answer is no, I don't have a letter from a current supervisor, we ask you to just briefly explain it. So once again, we don't have to wonder uh, why that's the case. And it's usually a very kind of benign reason. And we just have that in front of us. All right. Lastly, if you have an entrepreneurial venture that is not your full time work, so not something that you are going to enter earlier, you'll have the opportunity to enter that very same set of information here at the bottom of the page. OK, so I think of this as your sort of backwards looking professional impact piece. The more forward looking piece is in your post MBA career interests. So in this section, we ask you to briefly describe your career interests and how you arrived at them. What have you already done to pursue these interests and what do you need to do going forward? So this is not meant to be a full length essay. This is meant to be a fairly concise 200 word maximum statement on 
what's brought you to this point? Why is it that you're looking to pursue an MBA in service comes next? And what have you done to date to help set you up for what comes next? I promise we're really not judging what your interests are here. Um, what, we're, what we're evaluating is that you've done your homework, that you've thought about this major investment of your, of your time and your resources in the step that you're hoping to take. And we know that many, many people, in fact, change their minds once they get to SOM. We're not going to hold you to these interests once you get here and only allow you to pursue that path. But we do believe that if you've gone through a thought process that is thoughtful and careful and intentional to get to this point in time, then you're going to be in so much better shape once you get here, even if you decide to pivot. And so this is your opportunity to give us a sense and flavor of that thought process. Um, and so that's what you'll that's what you'll do here. We'll ask you to uh, select the industry that best aligns with your short term and uh, post uh, your short term and long term post MBA interests. Once again, this is not something that we're going to hold you to. This is actually more information I think that we gather sometimes to help clarify your career interest statement, but also to help us understand where the predominant interests of our incoming classes lie. It helps us better prepare to uh, to support you once you're here. So that's part of the reasoning behind that as well. We'll ask you if your interest involved being an entrepreneur within the first three years. Again, not something we'll hold you to, but useful information for us to know. If you are in fact a joint degree candidate, um, we'll ask, we'll give you an opportunity just to tell us a little bit about what that intention looks like and why the joint degree makes sense for you. But once again, two separate about uh, two separate application processes for each of those schools. Okay, and then as I mentioned before, letters of recommendation are sort of the last piece of that, uh, of putting together your professional experience and getting a sense of your professional impact. And as I said, I think there's a lot of resources that we'll have available to talk about who to, uh, who to approach for this. But if you are not a Silver Scholar, uh, Silver Scholars have slightly different instructions that are on the Silver Scholars uh, web link that I think um, will be or, or may have already been shared in the chat. If you are a typical MBA applicant, we ask for two professional letters of recommendation. So two people who have worked with you in a professional context or in a, in a capacity to evaluate your performance within that context. All right, so moving on to sort of that last category that I shared uh, with you, sort of your community engagement. So this information actually, I think, comes from a lot of different areas, including potentially your resume or your recommendations. But another area that we get information from is your activities. So we will ask you to identify no more than two undergraduate activities and no more than two post undergraduate activities. So you can do less than that, but no more than two um, that were your most meaningful ones. So we're asking you to do a little bit of narrowing here. What are the things that you've invested the most of yourself in and are most important to you? And I really encourage you to think about activities broadly. These are not just you know, volunteer activities, although that can certainly be part of it. It can be part-time jobs that you held during college. It can be familial responsibilities. It can be really anything that you've invested in significantly outside of your professional work that's meaningful to you. And so we'll ask a number of questions about those experiences, but we're, we're really looking to kind of narrow it down to the things that are most meaningful to you, um, because that's going to be most reflective of the level of commitment, I think, that you will bring to your community engagement uh, during your time at SOM. All right. Moving on to the essay. Um, and so the essay can really give us information about a number of different aspects of your candidate. It's really entirely dependent on what you choose to write about. But we have one required essay with three prompts that you can choose from. So I'll, I'll say that again, just one essay needs to be written. You do not need to, or we do not ask you to write all three. You'll pick one of these three. Um, one of them asks you to describe the biggest commitment you have ever made. One asks you to describe the community that's been most meaningful to you. And the other asks you to describe the most significant challenge you have faced. And in some ways, I actually think all three prompts are getting at the same basic thing. We want to give you an opportunity to talk about what is most meaningful to you. 
And by being able to do it through these three different lenses, you can choose to craft that in a particular way that supports how, how best you want to tell your story. And you'll see after each prompt, there's a couple of follow-up kind of questions that give you some food for thought about how to, how to approach uh, how to approach this component of, of the application, how to address your essay. But like I said, what we're really trying to understand is how you have approached something of real importance within your life. In SOM admissions, we are big believers that the best predictors of how you'll behave in the future is how you've behaved in the past and how you've learned from and responded to past experiences, even if those experiences haven't been all positive. And our, so our application process looks not just for your, uh, for your aspirations, but the action um, and evidence-based support of how you'll be as a student and as an alumni. So these questions are all really grounded within the experiences that you've had to date. So I encourage you not to worry too much about the topic itself. I have a feeling if you ask yourself the question, what's most meaningful to me, there's probably going to be two or three things that come to mind immediately. And I encourage you to pick from those what you're going to feel most comfortable writing about. Um, as I said, we're really not judging your topic as much as we are trying to understand the approach you took to something that was really meaningful to you. Um, don't worry about being memorable or unique. I get asked the questions a lot. Um, you know, what are some of the most memorable essays? And of course, there are ones that stand out more in my mind, but that doesn't necessarily make someone a better or superior candidate. Um, this is really on your own terms, and we're looking to understand what's meaningful to you. Um, and it could be something that is maybe seemingly in the scheme of things more mundane, but you have approached it in a methodical and thoughtful and impactful way. And that's that's the piece that we're looking for. Um, final thing I'll say about the essay, we get asked a lot of questions about um, writing a personal versus a professional, uh, writing about personal versus professional topic. I would say, again, we're topic agnostic. I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. I would just encourage you, um, because there's so many other areas of the application that do ask about your professional experience, to just push yourself and think, is this an opportunity to share something that hasn't already been shared, to add a new dimension to my candidacy that might not necessarily be clear from the things I've already shared? And of course, there will be things in the professional context that fit that bill as well, and that is perfectly fine. But I, that's just my personal advice is to push yourself to think about what is additive to the information that I've already shared. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Heading back to the essay, I'll just point out really quickly. There is a uh, reapplicant essay. So if you have applied to SLM in the last uh, two years, we'll ask you to just give us an update on what is new since your last application. Um, and then an optional statement. So if there's anything that you feel like has not been covered within the application itself that needs explanation, so I should uh, pause and I'll say anything that has been covered within the application but needs extra explanation, this is an opportunity to do this. I would not use this question to answer questions that we have not asked you. I'd really use it as a supplement to the information that you've already provided to give us any additional context that's necessary. And then finally, on the topic of context, uh, background information. So I'll start by saying all the information in this section is optional. It's really designed to help us understand elements of your personal background and where you're coming from and the choices and the opportunities that you've had um, within your academic experiences, your professional experiences, and in your life more generally. Um, you can answer as many or as few as these questions as you feel are relevant, but I will say this is very important and helpful information for you to have to understand your candidacy in a holistic way, understand where you're coming from, and the, uh, the, the factors that have enabled and challenged you to get to where you are today in your academic and your professional and your community engagement existence. So we'll ask you for some information about your parents or primary caregivers. Um, I'll say we use this information um, in part to identify whether you are a first generation college student um, based on the level of academic attainment from your parents or primary caregivers. Um, and there's information here about how to uh, how to approach identifying who those individuals would be within your life. We ask you information about your childhood, your high school experience, your um, some information about your immediate family, how you funded college, 
Um, whether you have ever been responsible for providing significant financial support or supervisory support for another individual. Again, all things that may have a very sort of relevant impact on the academic and professional experiences that you have had to date. And um, in addition to sort of these checkbox questions, we give you an opportunity if you want to elaborate on any of the information that you've given us here or any other aspect of your background that hasn't been covered by the questions we're asking. We encourage you to do that in the statement here. So I think, again, this is this is part of the, I keep saying the glue of the application. It's information that helps us connect the dots between the, the foundational building blocks of your professional and your academic experience. And it was pulled, to, pulled together in a meaningful way to understand your choices and understand your trajectory. Okay, so that is really the, uh, the application in, a quick nutshell, um, excluding the things that come post submission. So on this last page here, you'll see sort of a, a recap of the things that happen after you hit submit. So the first of those um, are your invitation to complete our video questions and the behavioral assessment. So the video questions I'll share real quickly are uh, a chance for us to understand how you articulate yourself um, in, in spoken form. They were originally developed to help us assess English language skills, and they in fact continue to do that for non-native speakers. We don't require any kind of TOEFL or IELTS or any other test of English language. We use the interview and the video questions to help us assess that. Um, but regardless of your native language, it gives us another chance to assess um, how you interact, how you communicate. They'll consist of three randomized previously recorded questions that you'll hear asked by a member of our admissions team. For each of those, depending on the question, you'll have 20 or 30 seconds to gather your thoughts and then 60 or 90 seconds to deliver a response. So in terms of prepping for this, we all spend our days more or less doing what I'm doing right now, which is seeing ourselves on a video screen. So I think in some ways that part of it should feel more natural to you. I do encourage you to become familiar with the time frame. 60 or 90 seconds can be an eternity or a snap, depending on who you are. And so just get used to what it's like to talk for that amount of time and what that feels like to you. Uh, the questions are not meant to be brain teasers or case questions or anything like that. The preparation that you're doing for a typical uh, MBA interview will be more than sufficient for the, for the video questions as well. What I will say here, I mentioned AI before. In a word, just don't. Um, don't try to type the questions into AI. Don't take such extensive notes beforehand that you're reading off of something. No matter how subtle you think you're being in the context of doing that, it's not going to come off as naturally as if you were just genuinely articulating yourself. So I really encourage you to stay off of AI entirely when thinking about the video questions. The other post uh, submission thing that will happen is the behavioral assessment. So this is an online admissions tool that's administered by ETS. Um, and it measures a set of interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies that are associated with success in business school. So unlike a cognitive test like a GMAT or a GRE, this is a non-cognitive assessment. And the format it will take is it's a forced choice module. It takes about 20 or 25 minutes to complete and it should be completed in a single setting. You'll basically be given pairs of, of um, uh, uh, statements and you'll have to pick the one that is more like you. So it might be, I like to go to meetings and I'm a very organized person. And maybe both of those sound like you, but you'll pick the one that feels more like you. It can be tough. Sometimes both of the statements you'll receive have sort of a negative feeling to it. Please don't sweat it. No one response or no even grouping of responses is going to determine whether you're admitted to SOM or not. We use it as a, with a relatively light touch in our process. And we actually use it to get a sense of your academic preparedness, which might not be kind of instinctive when I'm talking about what kind of test this is. But what it actually does is it provides an additional data point on a candidate's ability to be successful in the LSOM curriculum. We've worked very hard with ETS over the years to understand what interpersonal and interpersonal traits help predict success for someone who may not bring the strongest academic background to uh, to their to their candidacy, but who nonetheless have what it takes to succeed in an MBA classroom. So 
is is not meant to be used punitively. It's actually in, uh, enables us to take more chances on candidates who may not have the most traditional academic backgrounds or as much preparation there. So hopefully this is not a stressor. I actually think it's kind of fun to take um, and hopefully is a, a positive experience. And like I said, it's only about 20 or 25 minutes, but you'll want to leave time for that after the application process. I know we're up against time, so I'll touch real quickly on interviews. So interviews are by invitation only. It is primarily second year MBA students and alumni who were recent interviewers as students who conduct your interviews. Every once in a while, a member from my team will step in if we need more interviewers, but it's really meant to give you a chance to interact with someone who's more of a peer and a resource potentially to you in navigating your MBA journey. We ask consistent, relatively consistent questions across. Um, we really strive for consistency um, and fairness and equity and mitigation of bias throughout our entire application process. We want to make sure that you have a relatively consistent experience, no matter who you happen to be interviewing with someone. As I mentioned before, same thinking goes for AI. Um, I would really suggest not writing down answers, even if you interview uh, to video question or sorry to interview questions or anything like that in advance we're really looking to just have a genuine conversation with you um, and and again sort of have another dimension of your profile the last thing I'll say about the interview is even though it comes last in the process I know it can feel like things are an up or down decision from the interview and it and it takes on this outsized weight and I'd like to encourage you not to think about it that way it's one data point. It's actually probably not even one of the heaviest data points by any means within the application process. Um, we look at it alongside all of the information that you've given us through the process that I just walked you through. So it shouldn't feel like a make or break event in the application process. It's just one more data point. All right, finally, um, you may be done after after submitting all of this, but as I alluded to before, sometimes things come up in the application process after you've hit submit that you want to share with us or that you should share with us. So any changes to employment or your academic um, journey, if you are you know currently in school, a uh, new test, any of that information should be shared with us through our through your application portal. And it will be very clear within that portal um, for how to do that. And like I said, we try our best to incorporate that information, even if it comes after your application review. Um, but obviously, best case scenario is you're able to get in what you need ahead of the deadline and, uh, and we have that information. But please don't hesitate to reach out if there are real updates to your candidacy afterwards. All right. So with that, I know I jammed a lot of information in there, but hopefully that was a helpful grounding in how we are thinking about the different sections of the application and how you might approach as you think about putting together your application over the coming uh, weeks or months. I'll call out a couple of events that we have coming up that are a supplement to this event. Um, we have our best application advice on Thursday, August 9, where um, myself and uh, the co-leader uh, of the MBA admissions office, Bruce Del Monaco, will chat about some of the areas of the application in particular that we didn't get to dive as deep into here, a little bit of our philosophy and sharing, as, as I said, our best application advice and tips on how to approach those areas. We'll have application workshops run by region, and those are opportunities to get more individual um, kind of deep dive into areas of the application and ask questions for the, from the admissions officer who will be leading those. We host online admissions Q&As every single week. We have two of them, so we encourage you to join for that for any questions that you might have. I mentioned the online application guide earlier um, as a great resource. And then finally, if you have questions that just uh, can't be answered by these general resources, don't hesitate to reach out to us at mba.admissionsal.edu, and we'd love to help assist you uh, in any way that we can. And so with that, I hope that this was helpful in uh, giving you a good starting point. I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing many of your applications in the coming months, or even if you're planning further out. Thanks so much for your time today, and I'm looking forward to learning more about all of you. Take care.